Welcome to the Voice Teacher Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about some exciting things like should you be on YouTube and navigating some of the things that go with that, like how to not be scared, how to have an abundant mindset, and how to post consistently. Stay tuned. The Voice Teacher Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Voice Teacher Podcast. I'm Amy Geddes here with Sam Johnson. And today we are answering the question, should every voice teacher be on YouTube? If you don't know already, Sam is a YouTube sensation. I mean, he's just kind of blown up over the last few years. (laughs) Hey, how many views do you have now? Like total views? Somewhere around 89 million. It's it's a lot of views. It's a lot of views for sure. Yeah. I mean, okay, to put it in perspective, I think I have like 150 on my latest video on YouTube. So, you know, clearly I'm not doing the things that Sam has been doing to be successful. So we're going to ask him some of those secrets of success and try to help you as a voice teacher figure out, is this for you? Is it something that you want to implement? Should you? Would it help you? Would it not? Sam, kind of tell us how you got started with this. Yeah, so I started I started making YouTube videos about four years ago. And I started because I had just graduated from college and I had a few students. But um, when you're in college, it's really hard to get a full studio. It's just timing does not work out well. Like I had classes at 8 a.m. I had classes at 7 p.m. It just was impossible to make it work. So I really just needed students. I needed to pay for rent because I was also just driving Lyft and Uber as like make everything work together. While I also knew like I had been training for this for years, for years, and I have been teaching full time for a few years and just taken time off. So um, I was just trying to think of how I could get in as front in front of as many eyes as I could, because I really trusted that if people could see me talk about singing, that they would think that I know what I'm talking about, and then maybe sign up for a voice lesson. Um, so I started actually by I was writing a few blog posts and stuff because the teacher, John Henney, he had a course on like how to do some of this stuff. And I was going to get involved with Facebook Pixel and do Facebook marketing and all of that. And I, I wrote some and it just totally flopped. Like it, it didn't go anywhere. The big problem was people weren't able to see me <laughs> and hear mm-hmm. me talk about it. And the kind of people who would read an article like that probably already have a voice teacher. At that point, I saw there was one other teacher on YouTube who had done a few reaction videos to people singing. And I think that he blew up um, after reacting to, I think, Fergie singing the national anthem Mm. at an NBA game, which was a very interesting performance. And so I watched him and I was like, OK, yeah, I, I get what he's doing. It's it's good entertainment. I think that it's a nice formula. I feel like I can bring a different perspective to this and I can make it just try to really focus on education. And so I made a few videos and by the third one, it really just went wild. Like my third video, I think, got to a million views in a few weeks. It, it was just wow. really, really quick. What do you which... think it was that that sparked that, that boom? Do you think it was just kind of being at the beginning of this new format? Because now you see a lot of voice Mm -hmm. teacher reaction videos. There's, there's a lot of people who do that, but was it because you're at the beginning that it was something new or was it because you knew how to work the algorithm? Did you have help putting it together? I don't know when you started employing a video editor Mm -hmm. or if you did it all yourself at first. What do you think? Why did it go so big so fast? I think a lot of it was was luck and timing. I grew up on the internet. And so YouTube was never really my go to place. But I've been around YouTube for my whole life, basically, um, and absolutely my entire adult life. And so I just kind of got it a little bit. But at the same time, one of my friends who got it even more was the one who pushed me into doing it in the first place. She was like, you should start making this. And she ended up becoming my editor down the line. But I was really lucky that she she kind of gave that first um, push. 
So I was editing all of my own videos for quite a while. And when I was first starting with this, I was putting up at least a video a day, sometimes two or three videos a day. I actually timed myself once and from pressing record to getting it uploaded and public, I think the fastest video I got was like 48 minutes within wow. that amount of time. I was able to edit it, upload it and get it live which was really helpful when reacting to really big events. Like if you're reacting mm -hmm. to the VMAs or, or I, I did one of those for Garth Brooks singing at the inauguration. And mm -hmm. just as fast as you can get on that kind of stuff, that helps the algorithm quite a bit. Mm. But I think that my success early was really luck and good timing because my third video that I did was a compilation video of a lot of K-pop artists. And mm -hmm. K-pop fans are really passionate, very good <laughs> fan base. And um, so I, I I got lucky because they started giving me a lot of views. And then the YouTube algorithm thought like, Oh, yeah, this this works. And then when I started doing other videos, they still kind of promoted me for a while. So I mean, I, I don't want to devalue what I did, because I do think that I made good videos. And I was bringing in an original kind of look at the voice that was not as present on YouTube at the time. So there were really good voice teachers. It's just they were making videos for people who were already seeking out singing videos. It's like, I'm going to go to this person because he's going to teach me how to sing really, really well. Or um, I already have been singing and I've heard about this person or I'm a voice teacher already and I'm looking for this. Whereas what I was doing was getting myself in front of a lot of fans. And some of those mm -hmm. fans happened to be singers who wanted voice lessons down the line. Yeah. So did it boost your studio? I mean, did Absolutely. it generate the... Okay, the student yeah. flow that you wanted. Okay, yeah. so what about, I mean, we're the international voice teachers of mix, you know? We are a collection of highly skilled voice teachers who many of us have been doing this for a really long time. Some of us have, you know, are newer in our careers. But, but collectively, I mean, there's thousands of years and hours, well, thousands of years, maybe. <laughs> but like, okay, probably like a, a several hundred years worth collectively of experience and hours and hours of teaching. And, you know, I would say probably a very small percentage of them actually utilize YouTube or these teaching videos. Is this something that you think every teacher should try? I mean, at the risk of maybe flooding YouTube with too many reaction videos, but not everybody needs to do it that way. Should we all have some form of YouTube presence to grow our studios? Probably yes. Probably yes. Just because people are more likely to sign up for lessons with you if they've seen your face and if they've just heard your voice talk a little bit. It's much better conversion than any sort of print ad than any sort of thing that you're not moving and not being able to talk about it because people just are so nervous about signing up for voice lessons that they need to feel like, yeah, okay, I kind of vibe with this person. Like I could kind okay. of see myself going through that. And that gets past that initial anxiety where before when I was mostly doing marketing on Thumbtack and just word of mouth kind of stuff, first lessons, there was always so much anxiety on my part, just wondering, are they going to like me? Are they going to mm -hmm. understand anything that I'm saying? Where now I, I know that almost every person who comes to a lesson with me has already seen me talk for at least 10 minutes and they kind of got it. And so that's really helped me just kind of relax around it. And I do think that it's helped a lot of students who might not have been the type of person to sign up for lessons in the first place, start signing up for lessons. And that's the thing is that that fan base of other singers who like to sing themselves, but are not already seeking out voice lessons. That was kind of my untapped market. So yeah, I think that everyone should be on YouTube because it is one of the two best visual media, social media sites right now. If you want people to sign up with you, you gotta show off that you know what you're talking about. So do you think, um, because I know a lot of teachers would be scared to death, just like a student is scared to come and take a lesson from someone they've never met. It's kind of like, it's that movie star phenomena. Like, oh, I know you, I've met you, even though you're going, what? <laughs> like, I've, never, I've never seen you yep. in my life, but you know, but I think teachers oftentimes might, might be really scared of that. They might go, oh, there's a lot of criticism out there. There's a lot yep. of things. What would you suggest for teachers who, who definitely want to 
you know, at least put their face on there, maybe put just a couple videos. Do you need to do more than just two or three, just even just things that link to your website so that you have something on there? You know, do they need to be more consistent with it and post regularly? Like, you know, what's kind of, what do you recommend? Well, every video that you put up is kind of a lottery ticket that maybe it will hit really big with the algorithm and maybe some people will see it who want to sign up for voice lessons with you. And so the more of them that you put out and the more regular you are with that, it's just a lot more lottery tickets because while the, the subscriber base that you have definitely counts for something, it's not everything. Google and YouTube are huge, huge search engines. When people go search, how do I sing like this person? You want to be able to pop up or at least have a chance of popping up whenever people are doing any sort of search like that. You could get really lucky and just have one or two videos up and probably embed them on your website and then do other sorts of marketing to go toward your website. And then people would maybe see you through that way. But using just the idea of this is a huge search engine. What kind of things are people searching for that I could be really good at? And then just Mm -hmm. make a lot of videos like that. For YouTube algorithm, it does really seem to support regular uploading. It doesn't matter if you put a video a day or a video a week or a video every two weeks. Just make sure that it's regular with whatever you're doing. I definitely noticed I kind of fell off with what kind of high view videos I was getting when I just wasn't putting them up like two times a day, when I wasn't putting them up even once once a day. Because going to the criticism side of things, it was hard for me. Like YouTube was hard for me mentally for a while and it still can be. And it made it so that I didn't want to put up videos all the time because I was just not mentally in a good space for that. And Do you read all the comments that people post? I used to. I used to. Mm -hmm. I don't anymore. I'll usually read like the first day of comments at least because that's where most of my regular people are. My regular viewers will come and comment and I can respond to them and I can see maybe some of the more hardcore fans, what their their opinions are of everything and just see if I'm kind of making a lot of people mad or making a lot of people not mad. Um, but after I that, really I really liked, find... oh, Sorry. I just liked how your mom commented on the podcast. I thought that was yeah. cute. I'm like, oh, yeah. that's so sweet. And she like watches all of them. I don't even think she... my parents know yet <laughs> that <Yeah>. it's live. <laughs> no, I think she's seen every video that I've put out, which is really wild because I've put out some like, some videos on heavy metal and stuff. So I'm I'm really lucky that she's been super supportive with that. Even a comment from a mom will feed into the algorithm. The algorithm doesn't care who comments or what they're commenting. So the, the nice stuff is good and it's validating and it makes you feel good. And it can just kind of give you a good idea of what's working and what might not be working as well. Even the things that might be more troll comments or just there are going to be people who don't like you. As a voice teacher who needs to get students, you put yourself in a slightly public position of getting that kind of criticism. And so there there has to be some element of just recognizing there are going to be people who don't like you. If you kind of frame it like that, then you can look at it as just more engagement with your product. And as much engagement as you can get, every comment, every like, every subscribe, any of those things will help feed the algorithm. Sounds like what you're saying is you have to learn not to take things so personally and just objectify it and just be like, that's what they think. I mean, I think it would be hard if people started personally attacking you. Mm. Yeah. Which have have you had that? Yeah. uh, There's, I like real criticism and real arguments about why I don't agree with this. Mm -hmm. But I find that a lot of times on YouTube, especially when you're dealing with really passionate fandoms, if you say something that could be perceived as critical about an artist that they really like, they feel personally attacked themselves because Mm. they, a lot of people watch these reaction videos to validate their own opinion and to start Mm -hmm. using a professional's opinion on this to win arguments in other parts of the internet. Like I Mm -hmm. still see people kind of reference something that I said about Mariah Carey years ago. And they're like, actually, this voice teacher, like blah, blah, blah. And they really build me up. And then they're like, he said this about it. So you're wrong. 
And um, <laughs> that's like my mom knows you're the, more than your mom. She's a teacher. Yeah, I had yeah. that. I had that <laughs> conversation many times. My mom was a teacher with my friends in, in like you know third grade. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe people don't change much. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think that that kind of attachment that people have to their favorite artist or their favorite song, it's rare for someone to have that kind of attachment, disagree with something I say, and not be really mad at me (laughs) Mm. like it's Mm. it's very rare for them to say I disagree with you on this fact because actually I think that this was whatever it's like maybe I said something that someone's technique I wouldn't teach that someone to sing the way that they just did on that however I recognize that it worked it kind of got through and people like it but someone might hear that and then think that I'm saying this person is a bad singer, they don't know what they're doing. When in fact, it's like, actually, they're doing something that's really hard, because I wouldn't teach it because it's not very efficient. I do take things kind of too personally, it's it's a problem, um, just in general. But when I look at those comments, it is easier for me to kind of get through it. If I remember, like, they have no idea what they're talking about. Just honestly, like they have no idea what they're talking about and they they might be very passionate and have just phenomenal connection to this artist. But I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about like why it might work or what Mm -hmm. this artist might be able to do a little bit differently, because like as a voice teacher, if you're working with someone who's a really high level client and who can sing really well and is already getting a lot of gigs you can't just validate everything they're doing. Like right. you still have to give them feedback. But I think that a lot of people, when they see that feedback in public, they're like, oh, you just think that they're not doing anything right. And well, so and I what can good is a myself, voice teacher that's a yes man? Yep. I just have to remind myself that they're not listening for the same things that I'm listening for. And then I have to kind of refocus on why I'm actually making these videos, which It started out as just a marketing push, but I think it really grew into this idea that I can influence the voice world in general and influence perceptions of singing. And if I rethink about it like that, of it doesn't matter if these 30 people will send anthrax to my house. It doesn't (laughs) matter because there are 30,000 other people that might have a slightly better understanding of the voice. And I really have to keep switching back to that. And with view numbers, it's the same sort of idea. As someone who has videos with millions of views, it's easy to compare anything that I put up now to those videos with a lot of views. But then I kind of visualize what a 100 people in a room looks like. (laughs) And it is a lot of people. If one video that I put out even gets to like 300 views, That is a lot of people. I cannot work with that many people in a year. And that kind of makes it easier for me to get past the criticisms that people give or to get past the self-doubts that I'm not doing as well as I should be doing on YouTube, just because the scale of all of this is wild. And that's a big reason why you need to be on YouTube if you're going to be, if you want to get a lot of students, because the scale of it is just massive. You said something about being an influencer in the in the voice community and i think that's a really important thing like like whether we realize it or not we are influencers to our students we influence so much of the way they think about the voice the way they the way they use their voice their perceptions of what's right and wrong you know and especially you know that if you've had a student that's come from another teacher who's like well i know i'm supposed to sing from my diaphragm and you're going mm-hmm okay, let's talk about that. Or let's just avoid that altogether and move on. I guess really you think about it, should every teacher aspire to be an quote unquote influencer in the voice world, which might be different than being an influencer in your voice world, in your studio? I think it just in the voice world community is something a lot of us are searching for and Mm -hmm. feeling like we're part of something bigger than ourselves because it can get very isolating being a voice teacher. And you you For talk sure. to a lot of people all the time. But since I've started teaching on my own, compared to when I was um, working at a studio and going in and seeing the same like six people and feeling like I was part of a team, it's not as good for your mental health 
just in general. Well, and I think that's what Ivtam brought to me. Yeah. It was, you know, and that validation that, okay, we're all doing the same thing. We're all good. I know if I have a question, I actually heard this on another podcast. It was about real estate investing, but it was, she was talking about, you know, when your investors come to you and ask a question, never say, I don't know, say, that's a very good question. Let me consult my team of experts and I will get back mm. to you. And it made me think of singing. I'm like, because we talked about, it's okay if you don't know everything, but mm. Oh, that's a great question. Let me ask my team at IFTOM. Let me ask these amazing people that I have to work with mm -hmm. that I can get feedback from. And I, I love that about it. It definitely does take the isolation away, even though we're not in the same room, you know, all the time. Yeah, just knowing you can go to people and it's okay if you don't know, like consult somebody yeah. else who does. There's a lot of really smart people out there. But no, but yeah. no one person knows everything. So let's give our listeners some takeaways here. Like, you know, if we're going to boil it down, what's the best piece of advice we could give for teachers who are thinking about getting on YouTube, who maybe are scared uh, for whatever reason? What would you tell them to help them at least, you know, make a two minute video? OK, so I think one of the big pieces of friction that prevents people from doing this kind of stuff is being scared that no one will see it. <laughs> yeah, probably no one will see it. But you have to start. If That's almost there, a relief ever more, get than, the chance. Yeah. more than a worry. <laughs> yeah, uh, it can be for sure. <laughs> Another is, yeah, but someone else has already done that. Yeah, you're 100% right. Someone else has already done everything better than you. That does not mean you shouldn't do things. And maybe at some point you'll accidentally make something that is original, but likelihood is everyone has made everything already. Even if you aren't making something that is a total novel idea and a total, just everything is new about it. It's new because it's from your perspective. And there are going to be some people who have not seen the other videos on how to, uh, why vibrato is this thing or whatever. That, but as soon as you make your video on vibrato, someone's going to have a realization. And maybe that will give more context for the other thing that you're like, oh, I could, I could never make something that good or that polished or whatever. Another thing with it is regularity. If you can just kind of get in a habit of filming for five minutes once a week or something, just to get used to being a person who films a little bit, Start with that. Start with just a three minute thing. This is one thing that I learned in my lessons today and I thought it was really, really cool. And then as you get more comfortable with it and if you want to up your output, then start making more and more videos. But just start with anything like a small video once a week would be a really good place to start, especially if you want to go on TikTok, which is a way better algorithm than YouTube, in my opinion, for content discovery of people who don't already have a lot of subscribers. Mm. I think that you but should you be have using to post them, a lot. You have to post a lot on TikTok. Yeah, you have to post a lot on TikTok to stay really relevant. A lot of people are on TikTok. It's it is huge right now. If I was starting this stuff fresh, I would start on TikTok, not YouTube. If I was recommending you to get into TikTok or something, I'd say if you were teaching five days a week, at the end of every day of lessons, just Think about what the biggest takeaway you had from the day was, and then just make a little two minute video and post it just immediately. Then make it just part of your routine so that it does become just like a five minute mm. thing rather than, oh, I got to go do this so many times because there are already things that you do multiple times a day, like teaching. And if you can just mm -hmm. bundle it in with something like that, it starts feeling a little bit more natural. Let yourself be you just unabashedly you and give that away, give your personality away and also give your information away. Because uh, I guarantee that a student who sees a video that you're like, this is everything that I teach. This is everything in one 30 minute video or whatever. They'll see it and they'll be like, cool. That seems like they know what they're talking about. How much of it will they understand? How much of it mm. will they be able to put into practice on their own? Maybe some of it, and I think it's worth it to keep doing that. And maybe there's going to be someone that's like, oh my gosh, I get all of this. I never need a lesson. And I get it. And part <laughs> I wish I was of, that student. <laughs> right? Yeah. But the thing is, they, they, are, they don't really exist. Like maybe there's some of them, but they don't really exist. So if you can at least prime a person, like I know what I'm talking about. You've already seen this, that 
says like, oh, wow, this has helped me a little bit already. That's just going to up the chances of them coming to you for private instruction. That's mm-hmm. just going to up the chances of them going to your website and purchasing your course or any of that. And I think that a lot of times we hold these things so close and so dear. It's like this one exercise is the one that I use all the time because it works really well. And yeah, that's probably true. Give it away. Give it away. You don't need to hold on to that kind of stuff. And part of it for me is just this idea that I want everyone to be a better singer because I know how Mm -hmm. bad it feels to not be able to do the things you want or to be with a teacher that you're not really working well with. I feel like we should just give things away just as people (laughs) because like we're in this for a reason and it's to help people. The secondary Mm -hmm. reason is obviously to pay our bills, but like you don't get into this stuff just like, okay, I'm going to pay my bills by making music. Like there has to be this (laughs) other reason. Well, yeah, like nobody becomes a singer to make money. Everybody come, you become a singer because you're passionate about it because Mm -hmm. you've got, you know, your soul is begging to express and Mm -hmm. share and give. So I think that's wonderful. Um, yeah, just like being generous, having that abundance mentality that there's there is enough and to spare. Like there is plenty of good things to go around. And the more you give, the more you grow. It's like you mm-hmm. get more back when you give more rather than mm-hmm. like you're saying, hold, holding it tight and being miserly and selfish with your skills. Because if you're not giving it away, somebody else is. And mm-hmm. other people are growing and they're gaining trust and and helping and they're excelling and you are probably going to shrivel up with your four exercises that right. you keep all to yourself. Nobody can know. You know, I even learned yep. something really cool this week. A student of mine, she was having some laryngospasms at night when she was sleeping and it was really scary. And the SLP told her to do this one exercise and... So I, sh- I just on a whim, like on my next student, I just tried it. I was like, he was having some tension. I was like, okay, we'll do this thing. And, and he did it and it worked. I was like, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> you know? So maybe I will share that. I will record that and share that on my YouTube and see. Yeah. <laughs> see if it Is helps anybody. Is there a video anybody. of someone else already saying that? Maybe. I have maybe no not. idea. Probably. I don't know. But it doesn't even matter because like, even if someone else has done it, you're going to do it better for someone. Maybe not better Mm -hmm. for everyone. You're going to do it better for someone. And so I think that framing it all like that makes it almost exciting to make these kinds of videos rather than like, oh, I got to go do this. It's a marketing thing, blah, blah, blah. I don't like doing the marketing because I'm just (laughs) a voice teacher. That's totally me. (laughs) That's what most of us are like, right? I mean, the kind of people who get into doing this, like, (laughs) How many 18 year olds are like, okay, do I go to to music school because it's this thing that I love or do I go uh, do business and actually have a chance of making some money right after? Like Mm -hmm. you you have to be a certain kind of person to pass that kind of stuff up in the first place. And most of the time, like just in general, it seems like musicians aren't as into the business side of things or aren't as into the marketing side of things even though they're really good at it just because they're like expressive and they they're everything that you might want in marketing. It's just learning like that's enough. <laughs> right. You don't need to do all of these <laughs> other things. You just need to be yourself and turn a camera on and give a sort of prompt. And that's enough. Hmm. I love it. Okay. Well, just to wrap up those, those last comments, the three takeaways for teachers, don't be scared. It's okay if somebody else has done it. Post consistently because you want to, whether that's once a week, once a day, once a month, whatever, post consistently so that you show up in YouTube and be generous. Don't be afraid to give it away because everybody, somebody is going to need what you have to say in the way you have to say it. The one other thing I would say is when you're making YouTube videos, they're not going to go away after like a week, usually. And I, it sure seems like Google is not going to just go away. So this stuff is going to be preserved for a long time. And even if it's not super, super relevant, down the line, it could be someone searches out one thing and sees a video that you put up six years ago and it's like, oh, this is the person for me. So even if you take breaks, like at least start building that library, because again, every video you put up is a lottery ticket that you might cash out on at some point. Awesome. Well, thanks well, so, thank much, so much, Sam. This Amy. has that been, was fun. <laughs> that was really fun. 
All right. Well, um, thank you for listening, teachers. We just have such a good time. I learned so much from Sam today. So um, maybe you'll actually see some videos from me at some point. But usually I just I just have to come do the podcast <laughs> so that <laughs> Sam makes me do a video every week. Anyway, but if you have questions about IvTom or if you're interested in downloading any of the past conferences, because maybe there's something that one of the presenters have said in those lectures that might mean something else to you. If you want to get some of that knowledge and catch up on some of the things that we've learned over the years, go for it. You can get them for only a hundred bucks at ifTom.org. And the most recent one is only $200. So I would say, go get those, catch up, come and join us and learn and grow. And just so that you can be generous too, because then you'll know more. So anyway, you teachers are wonderful. This was a great podcast. We'll see you guys next week. Good work. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Voice Teacher Podcast brought to you by IFTOM, International Voice Teachers of Mix. Your co-hosts are Sam Johnson and Amy Geddes. Learn more about IFTOM at iftom.org and find Sam Johnson at vocalese.net and Amy Geddes at breakthrough-studios.com. Voice over and theme song by Maz Mazak and this podcast is edited by Amber. You have been listening to ah, the Father of Voice Teacher Podcast.